Um, so I'll be talking about finding bugs in control programs, and in particular, um, how programs that depend intimately on the absolute and relative timing of inputs can raise some challenges when trying to verify program behavior. Yeah, so they'll involve a little bit more formal methods with this talk than some of the others. Um, this is joint work with my advisor uh, at UIUC, Matt Caesar, and some collaborators during an internship at MSR, uh, Ratul Mahajan and Madan Musirathi. Um, so we're particularly interested in finding bugs in control programs, um, and they're quite common these days. We're uh, seeing control programs used to control uh, home automation systems, software-defined networks, the Internet of Things. And they tend to have a similar structure um, where there's some code executing on a centralized controller that orchestrates the behavior of a disparate set of devices. And we focused on two different uh, control systems, home automation and software-defined networks. So in home automation, we have a control script that is managing the state of devices like locks and lights and alarms. And these have become cheaply available over the last couple of years, and installation is usually as easy as just plugging it into the wall. And um, in software-defined networks, we have this separation of the control and data plane that allows for program running on the controller to add and remove forwarding rules and switches uh, based on a global view of the network. Um, and the scripts running on these centralized controllers tend to have a similar event-driven structure. So there's typically a set of triggers, and these are events that occur, can occur in the real world. So things like a light being switched on, motion being t detected, or a packet arrival. It can also be something like the time of day or a timer firing. And each trigger oops, ha has an action associated with it. Um, so on the left, there's a home automation example um, that says if motion on the porch is detected twice within one second and the light level is below some certain value, the, the light will be turned on. And then it's also turning the porch light off at 6 a.m. and on at 6 p.m. And then on the right, uh, there's an SDN example where uh, on a packet arrival it caches some host address and then there's a cleanup timer function that would be invoked by some timer and this would iterate through the cache and clean out entries older than five seconds. So you can see that there's a dependence on uh, absolute and the relative timing of events in these systems. Um, but what happens when the automation rules in these uh, systems are incorrect, incorrectly configured? So uh, if thermostats are set incorrectly or doors lock or unlock at the wrong time, it can pose a security or monetary risk. And misconfigured routes in a network can create black holes or overload switches, um, and this can cause service outages. And so despite the seemingly simple languages for these systems, their complexity can actually be quite, quite high. And the reason for this is that they're often programmed to behave differently at different times. And so reasoning about the script behavior can be difficult. And ideally, we'd like a tool where we can explore all possible, future, uh, all possible futures of a program and know what states it can be in at any given time. Uh, so one option to do this is to test the script systematically using a technique called model checking. Uh, and we don't necessarily want the user to have to model their script as a state machine and keep it up to date with changes, um, so we can instead build it dynamically. So suppose we have uh, the script on the left and there's three triggers, one for motion, one for the porch light being turned on, and one for a timer firing. And the intended behavior is that we keep the light on for one minute and um, it, keep it on for one minute after motion occurs or the porch light is switched on. Um, and in testing the system, we don't want to actually modify the states of the actual devices when we test it. Uh, so um, we can create some virtualized copy of it by uh, creating a model of the controller and the underlying devices. Um, and this is a one-time cost associated with each system. Um, and our exploration would start by checkpointing the st state of the system. And this is simplified in uh, systems like home automation and SDN where, the, where there's a centralized controller with knowledge of the global system state. And a checkpoint would consist of each device's state, in this case the porch light being on or off, and the timer, whether it's enabled or disabled. And so from this state, we subject um, the system to all possible events. And by this I mean that we'll introduce a transition uh, for each trigger in the code. 
and then we try this from each state that we generate. Um, so uh, on a motion transition, we would uh, essentially execute the uh, motion detection uh, event handler. So it start by deserializing the state, executing the trigger, and then reserializing the state. If we haven't seen the resulting state before, uh, we would add it to a queue or a stack of unexplored states, and we continue this until there's no new states left to explore. But the problem with this is that um, for the type of programs we're interested in testing, this isn't quite enough. Um, so we call this a type of untimed model checking because there's no notion of time uh, within the states. And ideally, we'd like to retain the ability to explore the program without needing to arrive the state machine, uh, but in a way that more systematically handles time. So if you see uh, on the left, there's two timer transitions from the bottom two states. And so these are essentially occurring at any time in the system. So, um, you know, there's nothing enforcing that the timer actually fires uh, at one minute as the code requires. Um, so the reason that this isn't enough is because anything in our system can happen at any time. And we can de uh, decompose this problem into two parts. The first is that the event domain is very large. And events, like motion, uh, might be processed differently depending on environmental factors, like the level of light or the temperature in a room. Um, and testing all these possible environmental factors isn't feasible. The second. Uh, issue is that time is continuous, so we need some way to discretize time. And choosing a granularity here is tricky because if it's too coarse um, and we subject our uh, system to events at too coarse a granularity, then we miss potential behaviors. But if it's too fine, then our exploration will be redundant because we'll be testing times where the system isn't evolving. And we'd also like to be able to uh, test the properties of our system that are based on time. Uh, so we'd like to be able to create invariants that say uh, a light should never be on at 3 a.m. or it should always turn off five minutes after motion. So our solution to this is twofold. Uh, we handle the domain of possible events and environmental inputs using a program analysis technique called symbolic execution. Um, and so the idea of combining symbolic execution and model checking isn't new. Uh, so I'll mainly focus on the second part. Um, but the idea here is we can use it to uh, divide up the input space into equivalent sets, and then we only need to try one transition for each value from each set. Um, and then we correctly reason about time by leveraging a theory from real-time systems verification called timed automata. So timed automata are state machines extended with a finite number of real value clocks. And the constraints on these virtual clocks divide time into equivalent regions such that the exact value of time within the region doesn't matter. So in a timed automata, autom automaton, all the clocks rest at the same rate, and they, and they ex progress explicitly through a special delay transition. So here, nothing happens in the system except there's a delay. And after a transition, one or more clocks can be reset. Um, and so uh, using these clock constraints, we can partition time into a finite number of equivalence regions. And these regions are the main feature of time automata that we're interested in. Um, and so basically all points within a region are equivalent with respect to their successor regions. So that is a delay from any point within a region will uh, progress time to the same region for all those points. Uh, so let's look at an example with two virtual clocks. Um, so I have the somewhat similar example to the, the first slide where we have this heuristic to filter out false motion detections by requiring two motion events within a one second window. Um, and then I've added a timer that leaves the um, porch light on for one second. And I've used one second here just to simplify the example. Um, so we can represent the range of times for these two virtual clocks uh, using two dimensions. And the first thing we need to consider is that things can happen at constant boundaries. So uh, timers can fire, might be firing at exactly one second. Uh, so we need to partition this plane by line segments. Um, and because the constant boundaries matter, we also need separate regions at intersections. Uh, but we additionally need to, to partition this open space bounded by the line segments with a diagonal segment. And the reason for this is because two points within this region might have different successor regions. Um, so if you consider these two points, a delay will move each point to its adjacent region. And since it's different for these two points, 
we need to partition this region. So for two virtual clocks, we end up with nine line segments, four intersections, and five open spaces. Uh, so now we can use this to carve, so now we have a way to carve the continuous time domain into a tractable number of regions. And we can look at how we can use these regions and delays to uh, more systematically handle time when model checking. So I'll use the same example from our previous model checking uh, slide. And so we have one virtual clock, which is timer, and it has a one minute constraint. So if motion is detected or we uh, turn the porch light on, the light stays on for one minute. Um, and our delay transition will take us from one region to the immediate, uh, ad immediately adjacent regions. Um, so we have our state from before with the porch light and the timer, but we extend the state to have this notion of time. So in this case, the, the timer value might be zero. And then as before, we subject the system in the state to some stimuli like motion or the light being switched on. Um, and we also add a delay transition. And uh, nothing here, nothing happens here except the timer, the time value is incremented. And then you can see that if there's a, uh, an event like motion or uh, the port light being turned on, this will reset the timer. Um, and then we can continue uh, building our time automata until there's no new states left to explore. And so the main uh, drawback with this approach is scalability. And one of the costly operations is that every time we execute a transition, we actually have to run some code. And this requires serializing some state, running code, and then reserializing the successor state. And so to handle this, we introduce this form of memorization where we can treat states within a similar set of regions similarly. And so we say two uh, clock values have the same clock personality if their uh, clock values are equivalent with respect to all clock constraints. Um, so in the example here, these two points, uh, they're both less than the two clock constraints, five and two. Um, and so with respect to the execution of code, um, they, they will behave the same up until some boundary. Um, so in this case, we would say there are four clock personalities. And then uh, instead of having to execute code, we can actually predict successors um, from a similar state. So if we have some state S1 and we actually execute uh, transitions from this uh, state by running code, we'll say we computed the successors. And then later on in our explanation, uh, exploration, we might encounter some state S2. And if uh, they're, both, uh, have the, they're both equivalent with respect to the clock constraints, they have the same variable and device values. Um, we can then predict the successors of S2 by essentially copying the device states from the successors of S1 and retain the clock values of S2 um, except for those clocks that are reset. And so this, the cost of this prediction is only in copying a data structure rather than the whole serialization and uh, deserialization process. Our second optimization deals with uh, reducing the state space by reducing the number of virtual clocks. So uh, virtual clocks significantly impact the efficiency of exploration because uh, they increase the number of regions exponentially. And so we can take advantage of two instances where we can combine virtual clocks. So one is if we have uh, a series of actions followed by sleeps. Um, and this is possible because under the execution model in these systems, um, uh, there'll only be one sleep call active at a time. So they're not multi-threaded and then they won't be preempted. Um, and to do this, we introduce a new program variable where we track which action should be taken when the timer fires. And in home automation systems, um, there tend to be a lot of actions based around time of day. So something happening at sunset and then one hour after sunset. Um, and this is kind of similar with the previous case. Uh, we can basically model these using one timer with an additional program to cycle through the actions. So we can think of the timer starting at midnight and then sleeping until the first action and then uh, so on. Uh, for the third optimization, uh, we tackle the number of device states. And we observe that in a lot of the control programs is essentially a uh, composition of multiple independent control loops. 
Uh, so one loop controlling devices in the kitchen, and one controlling uh, devices outside. And instead of having to explore the program as one large control loop, we instead can split it into independent parts. Um, and we do this uh, during program analysis. So when we symbolically execute uh, the program, uh, we determine the independent sets of variables using taint tracking. So for each event handler that we symbolically execute, uh, a variable that reads or writes another becomes tainted with that, with that variable's values. And then we look at uh, these taints across all uh, symbolic executions of the event handlers. And so then we implemented this in a tool we called DeLorean that we wrote in C Sharp. And uh, it consists of three stages. So it takes as input a control program and some safety invariance. And it optionally, we can give it some models of devices and amount of time to explore. Um, and from here, we translate the control program into one where the virtual clocks have been replaced with, uh, I'm sorry, where time operations have been replaced with virtual clocks. And so for home automation, we uh, wrote these translators for two popular languages, uh, IC, ISY, and ELK. Um, and so this produces a C-sharp program that we then symbolically execute with a symbolic executor called PEX from MSR. And from this, we can extract the clock constraints, the environmental factors like um, temperature and light, and also extract the independent control loops. And then we model check these using the time automata based uh, technique I described earlier with delay transitions. And then we output violations and path con paths consisting of events and delays. Uh, so we tested this on 10 home automation scripts that were running in real homes. Uh, these, had, these scripts had up to 50 devices and 90 rules or triggers. Um, and we found three bugs in, in these systems, uh, that, uh, four bugs, three of which were related to time. And so these were bugs uh, where uh, lights were turning on at the wrong time or the wrong amount of time after some event. Um, and we also found that for home automation, the performance was pretty good. Uh, and we could actually explore uh, programs faster than real time. So what this meant was um, you know, we would checkpoint a system and we, wanted, we would want to see what the system looked like in one hour. And we could actually generate all those states uh, in under an hour. Um, and the reason that this is possible is because um, the execution of rules is, is not CPU intensive. They tend to be basically instantaneous. Um, and we also found that our prediction optimization can help speed up exploration of larger programs. Um, so these three programs on the right are quite small, and they didn't have a lot of virtual clocks. So this meant there's less regions and less opportunities for prediction. Um, so the cost of actually looking for potential similar states was more costly. Um, and we also compared our exploration with an untimed version of DeLorean. And so this was to compare it to basically untimed model checking. Um, so what we did was we explored each script for one hour of time. And this is one hour of wall clock time within the script, not one hour of, uh, of, of, of late, basically, uh, CPU time. Um, and then we compared the states generated um, in one hour to the states generated by untimed exploration. And um, because untimed exploration has no notion of time, um, it can basically generate states that won't happen in practice. Uh, and this can make it hard for developers to actually uh, understand the likelihood of a bug occurring in practice because in some cases, uh, there can be a lot of extra states generated. Uh, we also tested this uh, our, our tool on uh, some software-defined networking apps. And the key difference here was that these apps had no dependence on uh, time of day. So all virtual clocks were relative. Um, and the main source of virtual clocks here were flow timers. Uh, so in uh, software-defined networks, flows are installed in switches, and they have hard and soft timeouts. Um, and we compared this to NICE, which is a model checker uh, for uh, software-defined networking applications. And it performs untimed model checking. And uh, we compared the number of, of lines ex executed uh, when testing the program 
in NICE and in DeLorean, and we found that uh, the, the app with the most dependence on time had the, the best, the most improvement uh, with our tool in, uh, in terms of code coverage. And the two, two apps on the, on the right had very shallow dependencies on time. Um, so in conclusion, uh, some lessons that we learned when building this tool was that even some simple programs can have complex dependencies on time. And um, finding these bugs isn't necessarily easy. Uh, sometimes it's a trial and error process um, uh, of encountering some unintended behavior and then having to update a script. Uh, and we also found that when considering uh, time uh, when model checking, it's especially useful for, useful for programs with dependencies on absolute and relative time. And programs with shallower dependencies uh, benefit, benefited less from this type of exploration. That's it. Questions? I have uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, first is, uh, uh, is your tool assuming single-threaded programs? Yes. Okay, so you don't deal with like you know, threads or interrupts? No. Stuff. Okay. But that is something we want to consider. But the, I mean, the, most of the systems we looked at didn't have uh, that execution model. Sure. Um, a second question is how does your tool deal with uh, loops other than the main control loop? Um, you can unreal it? Like um, so from our perspective, I mean, um, in, in terms of like checkpointing a state, um, so we assume, uh, we assume an event handler runs until completion. Um, and uh, if there's sleeps within uh, a, a single event handler, so you, you know, on motion, maybe you turn a light on and then sleep and then turn it off rather than using a timer, um, we would basically just split that event handler up into do two different ones and use a timer. So you assume like there's a no loop inside a event handler? Um, uh, no loop that has some, that's inducing some temporal behavior. So like a sleep not, we assume that there isn't a sleep within a loop. Yes. Thank you. So let's thank our speaker again.